very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. It's a pleasure and also an honor to be participating in this series after so many uh, great researchers that I, I've been reading during my PhD. Uh, as uh, Jim introduced, I will have a presentation maybe a bit different from the previous ones because we'll be more focusing in some applications. Uh, but I hope uh, this will be also interesting for the people working with, with the techniques and to, to see uh, a slightly different uh, type of research that we are doing using coherent diffraction imaging. So maybe I would just take the pointer. So uh, what I will present here uh, is part of the work that I developed during my PhD in the Brazilian synchrotron. So I also uh, let here the 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 affiliation to the Brazilian synchrotron and part is also uh, of my project uh, currently in the University of Grenoble. Well, so since I guess uh, this topic is new for most of the audience, I would like to take some time to give you a bit of the context of uh, this research, uh, which is uh, a research that uh, started focus on, on astrobiology and paleontology. So astrobiology is a field that is uh, concerned to understand the origin, evolution, and the distribution of life in the universe. But so far, uh, well, 6th of May 2021, the only place that we have uh, find life so far is Earth. So to be able to understand uh, how to look for life in other places and how life could, uh, could uh, what types of life that could exist, we need to focus also in the study of the early life in our planet. Uh, so here we have uh, 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 schematics of the time uh, scale, the geological time scale of, of Earth. Uh, we have this planet that was formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Uh, just after that, we, we had the formation of the moon. Uh, and not much after, we started to have the first, uh, maybe, the first uh, records, like at least we expect to have uh, had the first, uh, the first microorganisms uh, inhabiting our planet. So before, this period, we had this, uh, this period of heavy bombardment of meteorites and uh, possibly if life uh, emerged before this, it was ex sterilized several times. So as soon as uh, this uh, late heavy bombardment uh, finished, we believe that life could already uh, flourish in our planet. But we don't have any rock uh, from this period, which is called the Hadean. Uh, all these rocks uh, were recycled and lost, so we can, if, if there were life uh, here, we cannot know. Uh, but we have some records of life uh, from this... Um, it's not working, my pointer... Yeah, so uh, three point, about 3.5 billion years ago, we have some, uh, some traces of life already that are records of photosynthetic microorganisms. Uh, since they are photosynthetic, this is already a type of metabolism that is, that is complex, relatively complex. So based on this, we, we estimate that actually life emerged much before these earliest records that we have. But they are very important uh, for, for our understanding of the beginning of life. So since these photosynthetic organisms start to, to, to develop in our planet, they start to produce oxygen, which was maybe the first uh, pollution that, we, that life uh, created uh, on Earth. And this was so important that about 2.3 uh, billion years ago, uh, the, the level of oxygen in the atmosphere was so high that our atmosphere that was first reducing started to become oxidizing. This was a very important event for our planet because since we have oxygen, new types of uh, life can start to develop. And this includes the eukaryotes, which is the group that will give rise to all other organisms, uh, such as animal, plants, and us. Uh, also interesting to see that uh, multicellular life uh, starts to appear not, uh, after two billion years ago. Uh, and uh, about 
600 million years, we start to have the first uh, macroscopic organisms that will give rise to the animals, to the plants. And finally, about 500 million years ago, we have the explosion of diversity that we find in the fossil record. So I think it's interesting to, 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 to give some attention to this scheme because uh, actually, since our planet has 4.6 billion years of age and we have life uh, since uh, emerging actually quite fast in the beginning of this, this time scale. If you look in, in, in the full time scale, we have seen that most of the, the time, geological time of Earth, the type of life that we could find were actually microorganisms. So microorganisms are present for longer than any other type of, um, of, of organisms. They are also more diverse, uh, also in terms of number. Even if we look to ourselves, in our body, we have more cells of bacteria than actually cells of ourselves. So if we look to this perspective, actually Earth is a planet of microorganisms. If uh, we were, if some uh, other, I don't know, uh, alien was doing a mission on Earth and go to our planet and just sample one kilogram of uh, Earth to look what uh, they could find, probably they would find microorganisms because they are present in all types of environments. Uh, actually, the, the first hominids, they appear in really last, uh, last moments of, this, of the history of life in our planet. Uh, so, if you are going to, 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 un, to try to understand the origin of evolution of life, we need to focus in the, in the, the origin of evolution and the, and the distribution of microorganisms. Uh, so this is an artistic uh, representation of a planet. Maybe you are not familiar with this kind of uh, image because uh, this is actually not Earth. This is actually a representation of Mars about 3.5 billion years ago. So as I showed you, 3.5 billion years ago, we already had the life flourishing on Earth. And back then, actually Mars had some very interesting conditions uh, for the study of life. Uh, I have... I don't know if you can see, but yeah. So back then, uh, Mars had the liquid water, had atmosphere, it was protected by a magnetic field. So not much different from the conditions that we had on Earth 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, so maybe life could have uh, uh, emerged on Earth and traveled to Mars by the, the, the impact of some uh, asteroids. Maybe actually it could have been the opposite. Life emerged first on Mars and came to Earth, or maybe they emerged independently in both planets. All these hypotheses are actually considered uh, uh, in astrobiology. Uh, but one thing that is very interesting and different from Mars uh, in respect to Earth is that actually Mars uh, doesn't have uh, tectonic activity. Uh, so on Earth, most of these old rocks, they were actually recycled by the tectonic activity. But on Mars, when we go and we study the rocks from there, actually most of them were formed billions of years ago. So they are a very interesting opportunity for us to look for possible records of fossil life in this planet. And well, this is actually already happening. I think most of you could have seen a few months ago these very impressive images of the landing of the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover on Mars. Uh, we could actually watch for the first time the landing of, uh, of a rover uh, in other planet. And uh, Perseverance is actually a mission that is focused in the search of traces of past life on Mars. Uh, so Perseverance uh, we will not only look for, for rocks and traces of life, but it also has these uh, this, this structures to, to, to actually dig the planet and collect samples that will be stocked in some cylinders uh, that will actually uh, be planned to, to come back to Earth in the near future. So there are probably in the 2030 some missions that will go and collect the samples collected by Perseverance to bring back to Earth. So we could take the samples to our labs, to our synchrotrons, to the best laboratories that we can have on Earth, and try to look for records of life. Uh, so if you want to, 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 to look for life in the samples, first we need to come back again 
to paleontology and ask ourselves, how can we identify a fossil biosignature? How do these things look like here on Earth, if you want to look for them on Mars? So I'm going to show you a bit of how these traces of past life look like here back on Earth. So uh, one structure that is uh, that we find, uh, we used to find quite a lot in early years. Nowadays, it's less common, but it still exists in some places. There are structures called stromatolites. Here you can see an example of a stromatolite uh, that was uh, that exists in Australia, Shark Bay. So these structures are formed by photosynthetic microorganisms, so they grow towards the sun. So they, they create this this layered structures that grows towards the sun. Uh, we also have an example here of a uh, stromatolite of almost 2 billion years ago. So this is a, a longitudinal cut of uh, stromatolite. So here you can really see the layers that were formed by these microorganisms trying to grow on top of each other to reach the, the sun to do photosynthesis. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, uh, one study uh, at, took some rocks from Greenland and described these structures as possibly the earliest traces of life on Earth that were stromatolytic structures. Few, not so, so long after, another study reassessed these evidences and said they were actually not stromatolites. They were actually created by the metamorphism, which is quite strong in these rocks from Greenland. So it's still a uh, controversial and open question about the stromatolites. Another example of, uh, of uh, traces of life that we can study are microbial mats. So these are biofilms of uh, microorganisms that organize forming these mats. And there, this is an example for microbial mats from Brazil, Lagoa Vermelha, uh, that our group from, from the synchrotron was collecting to do some studies. And uh, it's also interesting because uh, in 2015, the Curiosity rover that is also on Mars took some uh, some images of structures that look a lot with how this the structures generated by microbial mats look on Earth. But uh, when the study was published, the, the rover was already quite far from the structures. So just with the images, uh, it's not uh, well. Big claims require big lines of evidence. So this was just a possibility that maybe the structures were were formed by by microorganisms, but there's no further evidence about that. Well, and uh, bringing to the, the, now the focus of my PhD, another type of structures that we can study is microfossils. So microfossils, they are basically fossilized microorganisms or the remains of uh, microorganisms that was preserved in the fossil record. And they are interesting because uh, they are not just structures formed by life, they are actually the direct evidences of life, direct evidences of these microorganisms. And these images that you see here, they are actually some uh, claims of the putative oldest microfossils on Earth. We have these iron structures uh, from, from Canada, we have uh, these structures from Australia that we did, were described in the 90s, and still there are a lot of controversies if they are or not fossils, and also other structures from Australia that that uh, still debate if which of them are the oldest. So, as you can see, actually, every time we are talking about the oldest fossils of Earth, this is a very controversial and and uh, difficult question. And uh, why is this so difficult to answer? Uh, as you can see, these are claims of fossils, and in the bottom here you can see other structures uh, that were described in other. Uh, other rocks, some are organic, some mineral, and here in the right corner we have a, a actually famous case, which is the Martian meteorite Alan Hughes. In 1996, uh, researchers from NASA described the structures that look like um, microorganisms, but they were about 100 nanometers in size, so they claim it could be nano uh, bacteria from uh, meteorite uh, from Mars found on Earth. And even the, the president of the United States, uh, Clinton, went to the media and announced that they might have found life uh, from Mars. And after a lot of debate, they actually uh, contested these findings and said that they were actually abiotic structures. But actually, all the structures that you see in the bottom, they are not fossils, they are what we call pseudofossils. These are structures formed by volcanic glass that accumulate organics, structures formed uh, in laboratory, uh, and as I said, abiotic features. 
So when we find something that we claim to be a microfossil, we need to first prove that this could not be generated abiotically by any other way. And this is challenging. So why is it so difficult? First, when we are talking about this, this microfossils, we are talking about prokaryotes, uh, which are bacteria, and these are actually very simple in morphology and very small. They are few microns in, 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 the, in size, uh, which makes them easily, uh, you, you can easily confound them with some structures that were uh, generated abiotically, like these ones that I, I show in the images. Uh, since we are studying structures that are uh, rocks that are not really clean materials, we have a lot of things that happened or contamination or other materials involved in a complex system. We cannot just use a bulk analysis. We really need to, to go look at appropriate scales to be able to see the structures. And uh, we cannot forget that these rocks are very old. There were a lot of geological process happening, metamorphism. So we can say that they were cooked because they were submitted to high temperatures. They were squeezed, they were twisted. We had a lot of uh, different uh, levels of processing that uh, can happen. And then we will also affect and alter the structure. So they will not necessarily look so close to the original morphology. But there are also some technical limitations that I, I, I will focus a bit more because then we start to, to, to bring uh, a bit to the focus of this webinar. And uh, some of these technical uh, limitations are related to some, some specific characteristics. For example, bacteria are one to few dozens of microns. So if you want to, to have a technique to study them, we need to have a nanometric resolution to be able to look in detail uh, into the structures. But they have a uh, we should aim for a micron scale field of view if you want to have a full picture of the structures. As I said, they might be a, a bit uh, altered, so it's important to be able to look them in detail. In terms of contrast, this is also very challenging because these fossils, they are, they are within a rock, a mineralized matrix. The biology has been quite degraded, so we actually have a very low concentration of the organics preserved. Uh, we have a very low density contrast. Uh, and this, I will, I will talk a bit more, is quite uh, challenging for most of conventional imaging methods. And there are also other important aspects, uh, since uh, these structures can be very ambiguous, can uh, resemble, uh, abiotic structures can resemble fossils, it's important if we can have 3D imaging to be able to unambiguously resolve the structure. And uh, they are often precious if we're talking about uh, early, earliest uh, fossils. So we don't want to destroy them. And also, if we can have a non-destructive method, we can also uh, couple this analysis to other chemical analysis. We can also do some XRF, some diffraction, associate different uh, information, which will be essential if we want to, to give a final answer if a structure is a fossil or not. Uh, here, I, I just show you an example of a fossil which is just a sphere uh, that was imaged in different, uh, different types of techniques. So optical microscopy, Raman, uh, scanning electron microscopy uh, with uh, EDS, also just scanning electron microscopy, and also transmission electron microscopy. So what I want to show here is that for example, we can study fossils with uh, scanning electron microscopy, but because it will provide us the nanometric resolution that we want. But this technique is restricted to the surface and it's 2D. So we'll be able just to have a overview of one slice or the surface of this, the, the, the samples we want to study. We can also go for transmission electron microscopy and see in detail, but then we will need uh, again to look just in 2D and to have a very thin slice, about 100 nanometers thick maximum. So it will be just a slice of our cell. And if this slice is in not the appropriate, appropriate angle or position, we might end up uh, uh, having uh, conclusions that are actually misleading. And we can also do FIB uh, scanning associated to scanning electron microscopy, so we can get 3D information at the nanoscale. But this, the FIB uh, generate gaps between the slices, which will decrease. The, the resolution. And by the end of your ima the imaging analysis, we don't have any sample anymore, you destroyed it. And we don't want to do that if we want to, to, to study pressure samples or if you want to do complementary analysis. So 
just bring us to x-rays. Well, uh, most of you are experts in imaging with x-rays, and uh, we all know that uh, absorption contrast is very interesting if you want to, to see materials with very different uh, densities. Uh, but uh, I want to, to talk a bit of what this implies for the study of fossils. For example, during my master, we studied these fossil fishes uh, from Brazil. We took them uh, uh, to a normal absorption CT in a hospital. And if you do a common absorption CT in, a, in this kind of fossil, this is what you see. So here we could see some of the vertebral column of the fossil. We could see some crystals that grow in empty spaces, the outlines. Of course, the resolution here is not great because it's a hospital machine, but we could have an overview of the fish. But well, when we are talking to fossils, since the minerals have very similar densities, it's actually much more advan advantageous if we could explore the phase contrast. Uh, and we did that. We took the same uh, fish and some others, and we took to the ID-19 uh, in ASF. And this is the results for the same fish. Of course, the resolution is not at all the same. We, here now we have a micro resolution, but I would like you to focus more on the contrast aspect. So before we could not identify many structures, but now we can have details of not only the bones, but also the gills. We could even look in detail into the gastrointestinal content of these fishes. We could see the fish's last meal before dying. And if you cannot identify what it is, I'll give you a clue. So it was very impressive, the level of detail that we could obtain with phase control CT in these fossils. Uh, and these results we published also the first description of a fossil heart. Uh, so this is to illustrate uh, why we want to go for phase contrast in the study of fossils. Why is this so relevant for our case? So this brings us to tychography. Uh, tychography is also advantageous to the study of microfossils because it's a scanning method. So this allows us to, to image extended objects related to the resolution and to the size of the, of the beam. So we can uh, have images of the whole cells. Uh, we get a nanometric resolution, so we can go in detail in the ultracellular scale. We can get quantitative phase contours that I will show in detail that will bring us information about the fossil composition, and it's a non-destructive method. And of course, we can do this in 3D, uh, so it's uh, covering all the, the, the requirements that I, I was showing you in the beginning of this presentation. Uh, just a few details about sample preparation. This was our first challenge because when we are studying uh, microfossils, we start uh, in a petrographic thin section. So it's a very thin section of rock that we analyze in the optical microscope, 30 microns thick more or less. So we need to go find our fossil of interest and have them prepared in a pillar. So we need to be sure that this 15 micron pillar will have our structure of interest. And this was our first challenge. And uh, this means that is that this is actually an invasive method, and uh, we will have a, a field of view limited to the to the size of our sample. So basically, we took these images to the optical microscope. We chose structures that were close to the surface using transmission light. Uh, for example, here we select the structure. We use a reflection uh, image to have the same field of view, so we could find structures in the surface. So now we could find the same region of interest uh, using reflection, and we could take this to the scanning electron microscope, take the, find the same region of interest, take the same image, and then we could do a zooming sequence that will be allowing us to find these structures in the FIB microscope to prepare the pillar. Of course, we did all this by hand, by correlating the images, but ideally, uh, if we have a correlative microscopy, this, this work would be much easier. So uh, we took our samples to the Swiss light source, to the CSAC's beam line. And I'm going to show you here some uh, of our results, starting with this, which are called uh, uh, fossils from the Minky Mountain locality of the Gunfly Formation. They have about 2 billion years ago, uh, they, uh, 2 billion years of age. They were described as hematite microfossils, so the, the hematite crystals substituted the, the original material, so they are actually poorly preserved. Uh, and this is what we, we could find. So this is our pillar. If you look in, inside, we can see the fossil filaments distributed within the pillar. We have uh, high density crystals, uh, which are the iron oxides, and we have also other phases. We could segment these other phases. 
Here in green, I will, I, will, I will put the main body of the fossils, in orange, the crystals, and now we have an overview of these fossils inside the pillar of rock. But we also have nanometric resolution, so we can also go in detail and look in detail how is this material distributed, how, for example, these fractures inside what we discover to be the organic material, how is the shape of the, the oxide, uh, iron oxide crystals, cubic and um, and uh, octahedral, and now this non-destructivity, so we preserve the sample for other analysis. So, we uh, were very happy we obtained uh, 52 nanometers resolution for these fossils. Our contrast allowed us also to identify, for example, in this region here, we could not see anything in, in optical microscopy, but actually, when we look in tachography, we could see that there were actual materials that were not visible. And this is interesting because optical microscopy relies in transparency of the samples and in color for the contrast. So we got a contrast that was actually better than the contrast for optical microscopy. And we identified, we identified this brittle and low density material, uh, which is the, the darker here, and also these iron oxides uh, that I mentioned to have a cu cubic and octahedral uh, morphologies. So, we wanted to know if these are actually organic material. At first, so we even thought it could be just a, a, a void in the fossils. And if these, these iron oxides are actually hematite, because this is not the morphology expected for a hematite crystal. Uh, and uh, as I said, the quantitative electron density contrast of tachography helped us to go deeper into this information. So we could identify the organic and the mineral phases. So we use this approach uh, uh, for the, from Ana Diaz paper to, to estimate the electron density. Uh, and by estimating the electron density, we calculated the density of the materials. And with the density of the materials, we could see that our matrix was composed by quartz, as expected. Uh, our low density material was uh, with the density which is consistent with matrix kerogen, which was exactly what we expect for the temperatures that the sample was submitted. So we could see that was uh, mature, so slightly degraded kerogen. But when we look to the iron oxides, actually the density was not consistent with hematite, but it was consistent with another iron oxide, which is less common, but it's called megamite. So the mass density indicates that we could identify mature kerogen, organic material, which is very relevant if we want to look for life, and we identified the megamite, as I said, and this it was very interesting because although in our deformation hematite was the dominant iron oxide, when we go to the nanoscale, the crystals that are actually associated to organic material, uh, the, the taphonomic pathway of the iron oxide was not the same as the formation in general. The association with the organic material made it become a different type of iron oxide, which is the megamite. So we got this uh, very interesting uh, insight into the nanoscale of these fossils. A uh, second example that I would like to show you, uh, these are carbonaceous fossils, a bit younger, uh, from Draken Formation in Norway. Uh, so these are actually just uh, round morphologies, spheroidal morphologies, which is, which is simple. Uh, so basically when they identify these fossils, they just classify them all, all the same because we don't have many features preserved, just the, the cell envelope. But we analyzed uh, isolated spe species and uh, colonial species specimens. Uh, actually, these are the same fossils that I showed you in the beginning of the presentation, where they use different types of imaging. So now we can see the difference of uh, typography for the other results that were obtained uh, by other imaging. So even for structures that were formed only by, by uh, carbonaceous material, we had enough contrast to distinguish the organic cell structures. And this was very good because is the most challenging type of material to be studying with x-rays. Uh, we could also identify the, the crystal that was associated to the fossil. Uh, we saw it was actually not pyrite as previously described for these fossils. The density of pyrite is much higher and is actually a mineral composed of different phases. Uh, well, we could not identify the crystal, we got the densities, but we had so many candidates that we would need uh, further analysis to be able to, to constrain. Uh, which uh, mineral it could be, but we could see that actually this crystal it grow it grow 
uh, in the cell wall of the fossil. So we can see the cell wall inside the, the, the crystal. So we actually know that the crystal was formed in the fossil and uh, not uh, the opposite. So this is also very interesting insight into microbial amino interaction, which is also relevant when we want to understand the preservation of fossils. Uh, for the colonial fossils, we had a shift, shift in the feed preparation. So as I said, if we had a correlative microscopy, this would be more precise. So here we shifted uh, in few microns and we could not sample the full fossil, but we could uh, get part of it still. So we could look in detail uh, the, the two types of microorganisms and we saw that they actually have a very different uh, cell envelope ultra structures. While one is about one micron thick with some uh, uh, striations. The other one was actually much thinner, 200 nanometers. Uh, so this actually shows that the colonial uh, fossils uh, have much thinner cell walls and much less structure than the, the, the individual ones. This could be related to their style, this type of life, the paleoecology. Uh, but this is interesting because they are classified as the same fossil because the only thing that they can see in optical microscopy is the, is the, the spheroidal structure. But now we are able to, to actually start refining a bit this classification because prob probably they are not even the si same type of microorganism because the level of complexity is quite different between these two specimens. Uh, but we could, for example, now measure the thickness of the cell walls and see that this thickness was very homogeneous in all planes. We could uh, measure size, volume, the proportion of these fossils. Uh, and all this, uh, the, also identify the carrageen, as I said, it's very important if you are looking for fossils to be able to track the organics. Uh, and this is interesting because all these are actually criteria for defining the biogenicity of a fossil. These are the kind of things that we can use Tychography to look in a structure. So when we have a structure that we don't know if it's a fossil or not, we can do this kind of analysis and this will help us to identify if this could be a fossil or not. For example, a non-biological structure would hardly have a homogeneous 3D uh, cell envelope, for example. This is uh, a biological characteristic. So uh, this is the kind of analysis we can have. So uh, by using uh, tychography, 3D tychography, we can do non-destructive analysis of microfossils. We could have contrast to resolve even the carbonation structures. The quantitative electron density associated to the nanoscale morphology allowed us to identify kerogen, which are the organics, iron oxides, and do a geochemical characterization of these fossils. So we understood more, not only about the fossils themselves, but also about the fossilization process. And we were able to identify nanoscale biogenicity criteria. Uh, so we are taking the, the evaluation of the biogenicity to the nanoscale with this kind of studies. And this is, uh, makes tychography a, a potential approach to investigate samples from Mars, for example. Well, and just taking this a bit further, uh, now during my postdoc, we, we, did, uh, we decided also to explore uh, laminography. So we wanted to do the tree imaging of laterally extended specimens. And some advantages is that laminography, we can, don't need to do the pillar preparation. So we can go directly to study the petrographic thin sections that, as I said, is the, same, the first uh, geometry that we have for studying microfossils. So it's uh, faster, easier, and also cheaper. We don't need to sample a pillar, as I said, so it's also non-invasive. And this will allow us to have a flexible field of view. We will not be restricted to the 15 microns that will, it was, for example, the, the average dimension of our pillar. But of course, it comes with some drawbacks. We have a lower resolution than uh, with normal PXIT. And uh, we lose the quantitative electron density, so we start to have only a semi-quantitative information. So the scientific case that we, we applied laminography are these rocks from a very interesting place called the Rio Tinto in Spain. Uh, it's uh, two million years old, very young compared to the other fossils uh, that I study, but it's a very particular ecosystem. It has a very low pH, it's a very acidic uh, ecosystem with a high concentration of heavy metals. Uh, so it was very surprising actually to find uh, a lot of uh, microbial activity in this place. So this is considered uh, an uh, extreme environment. We study extremophiles that are organisms that survive in extreme conditions. 
and it's also a geochemical mineralogical analog of Mars. So by studying the rocks from Rio Tinto, we can uh, understand the potential of preservation of these microbes in acidic soils, such as the soils from Mars. Uh, but these soils, we already know, they have low potential preservation of organics, and these rocks are, are often uh, not translucent. And as I said, for optical microscopy, this can be a problem because if the mineral like hematite uh, is not transparent, we cannot identify a fossil that could be preserved inside of it. So this is an example of some uh, fossil filaments that we did with laminography. This was our first experiment. So we just, uh, well, we removed the, the rocks from the glass. We mounted it in a sample holder for laminography and then we sent them back to, to, to CSACs. This was the first uh, remote uh, uh, laminography experiment uh, for users, I think, uh, that Manuel said is in the last talk. So it was very, this is all very new for us. Uh, and I'm going to show you some results that we got from near and far field tech laminography. So this, uh, we first imaged these fossils using uh, far field uh, type laminography. We did a field of view of 70 microns, and we could uh, obtain a resolution of 110 nanometers. We could identify the fossils. We could go in detail and identify also other structures we could have not seen before. Uh, we could see this in context, uh, in 3D, just, just some images. Uh, of what we obtained. We still need to, to, to deeper uh, uh, investigate to try to understand what are those features, if they could be also biological or not. But we are very happy that uh, actually we demonstrated that this could uh, this approach could work. And uh, again, this will allow us to do all the, the, those analyses in this kind of fossils too, to understand the preservation of these fossils in acidic environment. Uh, and even more impressive for us was doing the near field echography because uh, we, we actually measured a field of view of 220 microns and we also obtained about 110 nanometers 3D resolution uh, estimated with Fourier shell correlation. So we actually were able to do all this field of view and uh, to see how not, now, not only the fossils but a much larger context uh, geobiological context for these fossils now with laminography. So we we're very happy with still very preliminary data that I'm showing. We still need to go deeper on it. But for example, we could see different filaments, we could segment them in 3D. Uh, we now will be able to, to understand also about the diversity because we can already see that they are not just one type of microorganism. We have different dimensions, different uh, morphologies here. So we'll be able to understand better the diversity of these fossils uh, from, from these rocks. Uh, it was also interesting because we could look to these places that were actually not uh, opaque to, to optical light, uh, to, 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 to visible light. Uh, and we could look in detail and see that they were composed of low density crystals, fatty crystals, but also some filaments actually. Uh, we could not identify them before with optical microscopy, but uh, with tachography we could see that, tacholaminography, we could see that there are actually even filaments, here you can see in green, preserved among these flatty crystals. When we look into D, we cannot see them because they all look uh, just like the flatty crystals into D, but looking into D, we, we, we are actually finding that this is much richer in terms of fossil preservation than we, than we actually first expected. Uh, so, first news, the fossils are actually not present only in translucent areas, not only in, for example, goethite, they are actually present in other agglomerates. So, we, we, we see that uh, we, see we have filaments, we have also degraded filaments, so this will also allow us to, to understand more about how fossils are preserved in different minerals within the same uh, geological context. We cannot find a higher density minerals associated, but we don't know yet if these fossils are actually hollow or composed by organics. We see that they are lower in density, but as I said, we, are, we don't have the same quantitativeness for laminography. So we want to explore this further. Uh, for example, doing simulations of a reconstruction using the missing cone that are typical for laminography reconstruction and see which kind of electron densities we, we could obtain. So actually, if anyone would like to, to, to help us in this kind of work, this is something that can be further explored and I think will be very interesting to understand better. 
But in general, uh, laminography, Tycho laminography uh, is allowing us to evaluate not only the fossils, but the surrounding minerals ranging from a scale of uh, hundreds of nanometers to hundreds of microns. So this is very impressive and it's a very important uh, range uh, for our type of study. So we are also now getting some access to the geological context of our fossils. And this also makes this approach uh, useful as a, a first method to be used to inspect fossils. So we can first do tycholaminography and do after X-ray fluorescence uh, and other methods that will probably damage the sample or require, require some sampling. So just to finish, our main message is that uh, both um, PXIT and also by XL are allowing us to, to reach a few hundreds of microns in 3D with anometric resolution. So this is, this is allowing us to, to, to cover a range of uh, field of view resolution that is also has a lot of potential to other fields in geology, soil sciences, environmental sciences, uh, not only limited to paleobiology. Uh, and just uh, to finish, I would like to let you the message that uh, microfossils are actually very interesting scientific cases for the third generation synchrotrons because they are radiation hard. So we are actually applying these methods that are quite long, quite time consuming, but they resist well. So they are also, for example, scientific cases that were used for the development of Karnauba, Taruman Station. Uh, they require nodometric resolution, so they also help us to push the limits of the imaging methods. They are quite flexible for simple preparation. Uh, and they cover a range of important scientific questions regarding morphology, structure, chemistry. So we are exploring not only the coherent uh, diffraction imaging, but we are also doing XRF into D, 3D, STICSEM, and even some scan sacs that we are trying to look for. Uh, for other features that could be preserved in the fossil record and, and so far it goes. And uh, for us, taking the paleontology to the non-scale is a really essential step for our field of paleontology if you want to understand the earliest records of life on Earth, but also if you want to be ready for the samples that will come back from Mars in the near future. So we will be able to also look uh, and be able to find the records of life in this, which will be the most precious samples of the history of humanity so far. Uh, with this, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of people that were involved in this work, both from Brazilian Synchrotron, from, uh, from the Swiss Light Source, and also from my, my, my current laboratory. And uh, with this, also thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any question. Thank you so much, Lara. This was really, really interesting overview for non-experts. So I hope there will be a few questions, curiosity, uh, technical questions from the audience. Um, please yes. you can raise your hand or write it in the chat or just unmute yourself and, uh, and ask Lara. Maybe I start, Lara, with, with a, I have a very general question. So it's clear from what you've shown that this uh, research has a large degree of interdisciplinarity. Uh, so, first question is how easy it is to get all these competencies together within a, a large team, I believe, or does one really need to learn a lot in different fields? And the second, in, the second question is which type of support and competence do you need at a beamline to, to be able to perform these studies? Yeah, very interesting question. I think uh, this field, uh, one of the main, main challenges is that it's actually a, a quite uh, new field. We actually call it paleometry, which is the, the application of physical methods to problems of paleontology. It's, uh, it, 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 it's really have been developed in the last few years. So it's quite challenging because uh, when we come to a beam line, we come with this with the samples that are very difficult for the people that work in the bean line. Uh, and when we go to, for example, to a geologist, uh, it's very difficult to explain why, uh, how we need the samples and what kind of things we can do. Uh, so, as, as you said, I have this interdisciplinary background, which helped me a lot, not uh, just for the research, but uh, the main part for me the most important thing is the communication between the different fields which uh, when i started the day they were quite far so 
now that we are bringing the samples and other other people doing other type of research like this, it's getting easier and easier because now the, the beeline scientists are getting used to the samples. So as I said, uh, for Brazil, it was interesting because they, they were developing this new 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 beeline for focusing coherent diffraction imaging. Uh, so it was interesting that we already were was we were already working with this kind of thing, so we could uh, already say so we need this kind of sample holders, we need this kind of environment. Uh, so actually, Carnauba uh, beeline will be very interesting for this kind of studies. Uh, but in general, it's it's. It's quite challenging, uh, well, especially sample preparation. Uh, so it requires really a lot of interaction. So we interact with the people from biology because in some aspects we, we are talking about biology, but we also interact with people from, from geology. So I think the, the most important, uh, let's say, competence is to be able to communicate in different areas because uh, it's impossible to be really an expert on everything, but I think it's essential to be able to understand uh, the methods, what they can offer, so we, we can bring this to the, to the scientific questions and say, hmm, maybe this can be useful. So I just hope uh, by showing this kind of work, we'll have more people interested uh, because uh, we really need more people pushing this area. And, and another question that goes also in this direction, um, I can see that I mean, you are saying that the X-rays are interesting because they are non-destructive, but then effectively yeah. you have to cut out samples and then, you know, laminography helps you in this because you, mm -hmm. you can use uh, preparation that you typically use for other techniques. And then if you really one needs more resolution, it's easier to uh, figure out an area that you can safely cut out without destroying completely your sample. Uh, but if you could dream um, uh, like a multi-zoom, you know, a multi-scale uh, facility, which are the techniques or which are the fields of view that you would need for, a, mm. a, a, let's say, one beamline or, you know, a combination of beamlines? Uh, yeah, we can even imagine, for example, we'll, we'll have the sample coming from Mars. It will be a crystal or a piece of rock. And we want to investigate if there's a fossil. So what do we need? So Essentially, we will need to combine morphology and geochemical composition. This is basic. Just morphology or just uh, chem chemistry alone, it's not uh, sufficient. So we could start, of course, with a micro resolution method would be interesting, but uh, to, to have an overview. And as I said, the laminography was interesting because now we are increasing our field of view. But we need to go down to the nanoscale and we need to go down at least to 100 nanometers if we want to, to look in detail uh, of an organism. But X-ray fluorescence is a method that is really necessary. So I didn't show, but of course, we, the next step of this, this work is always to, to do some uh, X-ray fluorescence because uh, we need also to, to have a, a chemistry that supports our claims. Uh, well, X-ray diffraction because mineralogy uh, we're also going to tell us a lot. But uh, I think uh, if we are able to have coherent diffraction imaging, we are already covering a lot in this kind of information. So basically, uh, now actually we we are working developing a system for this well samples that will come from Mars, and it needs to be a really multi-method beamline. So a beamline where you can really go for a sample of uh, hundreds of microns and uh, be able to, to, to go further to maybe hundreds of nanometers. Uh, I think Carnauba is trying to do a bit of this because they are already correlating a lot of things. But of course, then, uh, then we will have the, the restriction of the sample dimensions. So it's, it's quite complicated, actually. In the end, uh, if you really want to go for a nano, we will always need to sample a bit. And uh, at least we, we, we need to know exactly which bit to sample. So I will, I will go for micro microtomography, tychography, and if possible, 3D XRF. I think this will be the, the my dream, at least to start. <laughs> 